Go to 1 Samuel, as, as Jeff said, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Praise God. It's really good to be here. It's good to see all of you. A lot of you here. Welcome, all of you. Good to see you. I always have to pay attention to this little segment and this little segment because this is the last time I look at you. Okay, so you're looking good, but I just won't look at you. I kind of do, but you intimidate me, so I have to kind of, you right there, especially those of you in the front. So, um, God's up to some things. He really is. And, and this is a good time to, to be alive. Uh, this is a good season. I, I mentioned last week to be praying uh, as the elders gathered Friday night uh, to really seek God and to really pray about things. And just a little report on a very sweet time and a very powerful time. I, really, I, I believe with, with all my heart. I really do. I don't, and I, you know, I've been around long enough to not get caught up in whatever, excitement and emotional things, and I've been around long enough to become jaded. I've been wrong, you know, I've done, I've done the whole thing, but I'm telling you, this year, there's something going on, and don't miss it. I don't want to miss it. I want to be here for this push. Uh, it's coming. It's going, it's, it, it really is. There's something, there's things I'd like to share. I'm not going to share now uh, because I want to keep formulating them with our leadership team first, but there are some very exciting things. Let me just, let me just let you know a sneak peek, and though I believe that we're at a, somebody say, what are you going to do about teens? Let me just tell you this. We're at a all hands on deck approach right now. And what does that mean? I don't know, but I know that you're involved. And you, and you, and you, and you. And you. It, this is not who's going to, no, it's me who's going to pay attention to young people. It's you who's going to. Now, there will be people with specific tasks, but I want us to catch a heart that, what that one song say? Not whatever that song went. The devil, not, not today. Not today. Thank you. I I said you know I, I kept asking Alyssa, what's the first song? She says not today. I said, well, <laughs> when are you gonna tell me? <laughs> what's the first song? Not today. <laughs> like I thought, I'm in like an Abbott and a Costello movie. Get me out of this thing. And uh, uh, but to get that, not on my watch, devil. Not on my. I am not going to stand by and watch a generation go to hell. I'm not gonna do it. And it's nobody else's responsibility. I have to take it personally. It's my responsibility. And you don't get off the hook either because you're breathing. Therefore, you're part of this generation. And this generation is responsible for this generation. And so just get that in you. Some specifics will come out as to how. But I'm telling you, you can't imagine what a mighty army can do and go after things. So uh, in 1 Samuel 16, and Father, we ask you to speak. You're so good at speaking. You do it all the time. You do it in so many different different ways, and you can do it individually, you can do it collectively, Jesus, so we invite you, Spirit of God, to just do it in a great and mighty way. Amen. Amen. So we, the, the prophet Samuel is who we're going to first look at. We're going to look at him anointing David as king. We're going, we're continuing now back through the story. This week, the book, I don't have one in here, but uh, we have the books out there. We are in chapter 11 this week. So next week, read chapter 12. It continues on with the story of David. So read that. It's good. You're going to get a great, great picture of the, the, the whole of the Bible this year. Samuel, though, was a prophet. He was more than just a prophet. He was a pretty amazing prophet. You could make a, an argument. Uh, if I'm going to rate Old Testament men and women of God, Samuel's definitely in my top five. Like, who's the goat, right? Who's the, uh, who's the goat prophet? Um, Samuel might be it. I mean, you got you could debate Moses. You could maybe debate Joshua. Uh, we like Elijah, Isaiah, but man, Samuel's right up there. This is the guy. Daniel's pretty cool. Now I'm getting into the debate. It's much, getting much larger. Suddenly I have a top 10. Um, but Samuel was amazing. He was amazing as a prophet. He spoke the word of God boldly. He wasn't just a prophet like that. Out of nowhere. Um, out of, Samuel was also summoned back from the dead, but we don't want to go there. Um, the, uh, but, but Samuel wasn't just a prophet. He was also a judge. He led Israel. So he was a prophet. He was a judge. He kind of acted, acted like king. He, this guy was incredible. And when Samuel showed up, everybody was like, oh, no, the man of God is here. And not only that, when he spoke, people listened because it was the word of God. So Samuel's the guy. So I want you to just, I want to see where Samuel is now because I don't want you to get tripped up because maybe you're in a place like Samuel was at this time. A few years before, Samuel, if you remember the story, Samuel anointed Saul as king. Now, Samuel 
didn't want Israel to have a king. They demanded a king. They said, we want a king. They said, we want a king because we want to be like every other nation. This is a very sad thing. They said, we are tired of being special. We would like to be like everybody else. See, Israel didn't have a king, and yet they were a kick-butt nation. They almost didn't even have a government. It was a very strange way that they ran. It was God who led them. And, and, and they were tired of being led by the God of the universe. They were tired of God speaking to them. They were tired of if they obeyed God, they won great victory. They were tired of that. What they were tired of is they were tired of being special. Remember, God said out of all the people on the face of the earth, God's chosen the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, out of there to be a special, special, prized, treasured possession. And they re their response was, that's kind of a cool verse to say, God, but we don't want to be special anymore. We're done being special. Wow. Now, let me just tell you, many followers of Jesus Christ are saying that today. I don't want to be special. I would like to be like them, whoever they are. What, who do they want to be like? They want to be like every other nation. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine say, I just want to be like every other nation. I don't want to be like any nation. That's better. And, and they, they were saying, we no longer want to be your treasured possession. Let me just tell you right now, you are the treasured possession of God. And don't you dare look at your neighbor and say, I wish I was like you. You know what? They're not you. You're not them. You're not supposed to be like them. They're not supposed to be like you. They are called to be who they are. And if you become them, we got two of them and we only need one of them. And then we lost the you, which we needed also. Get out of that. Embrace being unique. Embrace being odd. Embrace being peculiar, weird. Whatever's, whatever floats your boat, embrace it. Say, this is pretty cool. Embrace it. It's really good. So that's not where I'm going. But anyways, though, that, so God said, go ahead, give him a king. He chose Saul. It was miraculous. It was a supernatural anointing of Saul. It was powerful. It was a word from God. He anointed Saul. He did it. He anointed Saul. Saul was his guy. He put him in place by the word of God. And yes, Saul. And guess what? Saul crashed and burned. And God rejected Saul. What about Samuel? That's where we pick it up. God said, verse chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Samuel's like, uh, God, you don't realize I'm the one who prophetically declared him as king. It was on me. And he failed. I failed. I made a mistake. I blew it. You ever been there? I followed him. I wanted him. I prayed for him. I tried it. And it failed. And so Samuel, the great man of God, was mourning for the king rejected by God. We're going to hear this a few times today, but I just want you to hear, failure is totally fine. It's actually semi-beneficial. So you're going to hear today that it's okay if you blew it. Now Samuel didn't blow it, but he felt like he blew it. And so Samuel's like, I don't know, God. And so God says to him, get your horn of oil, get ready to go anoint another king. Now listen, if you had just anointed a king, stuck your neck out there, and the king you anointed failed, and God said, okay, go anoint another king, you might be like, ah, yeah. I don't know if I want to do this again. Didn't work out so good the last time. So, so Samuel had to, what? What does Philippians 3.13 says? says? Paul said, forgetting what is behind, I press on toward what is ahead. It's a really key verse. And, and it's not just something you did or whatever. It is, listen, there is a past. Past is good. Past is bad. Past is past. We grow. We learn all those things. But we're never just looking and living and being tripped up and all that stuff by the past. Past is here, forgetting what is behind, looking forward to what is ahead. I press on toward the prize, which what which Christ has called me for. And so there's more ahead. So God said, go anoint another king. Amazingly, Samuel said, okay. 
And off he went. That's where we go. And he says, uh, he says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. Uh, because just in case you want to know political things, if there's a king in place who's a little bit loony, not advisable to go anoint another king. Okay, just if you're thinking of doing that, don't. Uh, because that king is neurotic and they'll get they'll kill you. So, um, so anyways, though, he says, he says, go do a sacrifice. Take a heifer. Say, I've come to sacrifice. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I'll show you what to do. And I'll show you the one to, uh, you are to anoint for me, the one I indicate. So watch this. When you hear from God, and this is also as a ministry, this is as an individual, whatever, God will give you order of steps and he'll give you a step. He will give you a step and you're to obey that step. He says, anoint a king. Saul says, okay. Then he says, Bethlehem. He says, okay. Then he says, Jesse. He says, okay. So he keeps following these steps. General, he's, what is he doing? He's going to anoint a king. All he knew now was Bethlehem, Jesse. So he went to Bethlehem. He found Jesse and he wanted to anoint his son. Now, he, it's like kind of a funny thing when you think, what is these? So he goes and he says, great, I'm going to anoint Jesse's son. This is going to be great. Hey, Jesse, come on out. Bring me your son. And darned if the guy doesn't have seven of them. Like, really? This is a problem. Now I got seven. So he's like, oh, no, how do we do this? Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. You know, so he's going through the thing, all these sons. And so that's, watch what he does, though. Um, when, he, when he comes to this, when they had arrived, Samuel, I'm in verse something, six. Um, well, you don't see with these eyes this book with this light, and it's a bad combination. Um, and, and some reason my screen got turned off today, so I can't even cheat. Um, when, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the, no the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. The firstborn came out. Jesse brought, and he wasn't just the firstborn. This guy was like, it, woo, baby. I mean, he was... Whatever, had a resume, shoulders were broad, stood tall, had whatever hair. Uh, see, I don't even care about color hair. If he's got hair, he's like, cool. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, so, you know, he's the guy. This is the one. This is the guy who was the star athlete. He was doing this. He gets the good grades. Out he came. He's got all these women. You know, he's, this is the guy. And so he says, oh, this will be easy. I'm going to anoint him. He's getting his oil ready. He's like, woo, here we go. Next king of Israel. And God says, he says, uh, no. No, not him. Watch what he says, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. What the heck? Why are they picking on short guys? I mean, really. Do you know that the Bible literally picks on short guys and bald guys? It is hard to be me. I'm telling you. <laughs> the coolest story in the Bible. They once picked on Elisha for being bald. Two kids did. And he called bears out of the woods and they ate those guys. So <laughs> you understand the scripture is cool. Um, the, but, the, but he says, don't consider his appearance or his height. Watch this, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So now watch this, because this is a really important thing. I, I thought I was going to preach a bunch of things today. First service, I ended up just preaching two. The middle one I'm skipping, coming back to next week. And that is this, that verse right there. The Lord looks at the heart. Man looks at outward appearance. I want to I talk on that next week and I want to actually spin that from both directions. So I'll give you a little preview for next week. One is it's easy to look at the obvious. But the other thing I want you to think about this week, the obvious changes if the hidden thing is genuine. Meaning, if there's something genuine inside you, you can't hide it, baby. You can't. Meaning, your heart will bubble out. The spirit in you will bubble out, just will. So we're going to look at next week, at least for a snippet, the inside out of how God makes somebody the chosen one. And it's pretty cool. It's not just the natural look. And it's not just you ever get this. Oh, if you could just see his heart, you'd like him. And I'd say, dude, I'm looking at his heart and it's coming out in really bad ways. 
Don't tell me if I could just see his heart. I'm looking at it and it's rotten because it comes out. Your inside comes out and if it stinks, it stinks. So, but that's for next week. You all smell good today. <laughs> and, and so God says, not this one, look at other things. He says, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then verse eight or verse nine, then, Jesus, then Jesse called Abinadab and he had him pass in front of Samuel. So here comes number two. Sam says, okay, we'll go with number two. But the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse that had, then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Now, I want to go into a little bit Samuel here because Samuel is being obedient to God. Samuel was obedient to God when he chose Saul. Now Samuel is saying, okay, I'll do it again. He's being obedient again. And he strikes out seven times. O oh, for seven. Not good. Like, not him, not him, uh, not him, not him, not him, not him. One more. Yeah. I only did six? Thank you. I knew somebody would count. Not him either. <laughs> Imagine though, I want you to really, Samuel was a real person and this is also us. We're following God. We know what we, God wants to do and we know we're in the will of God and it didn't work. And it didn't work again. Oh, for seven. I give him kudos to looking at seven, right? Because you might go there, you know, he gathered a lot of people around this sacrifice. This wasn't just in a private home. He gathered them to a sacrifice. And, and he calls me. He says, I'm going to anoint a king. Not him, him, him. No, 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 no. And no, thank you. Uh, the, the, and, but he, he had to deal with continual, it didn't work. Got to hear this because watch this. It's hard to fail. It's really hard to fail. It's hard to try something and it didn't work. And it's really hard to try something that doesn't work if you know it's God leading you there. Amen. I mean, it's one thing, we've all done this. We've all totally been dumb and it's failed. Praise the Lord, it failed because it would have been bad. But we've also been there where we're following God and it didn't work. I did this. It's what God wanted me to do. It's in the Bible. It's this. And it crashed and burned. So here's the question. What are you going to do when it doesn't work the first time? Or the second time? Or God forbid, the third time? Who would get to seven? It's a pretty rare person who fails seven times at the same thing. Do we have the fortitude to keep going because guess what? Number eight might be King David. Are you willing to keep going to number eight? Let me just tell you things you've done. I'll just get personal in ministry. Um, one of the things as I, I kind of this week, because I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, if there's one thing that defines um, maybe a lot of the ministry I've been involved with, the ministry here at Praise Fellowship, is um, we've tried a lot of things. I think they were semi-led by God. And we have crashed and burned at a lot of things. We've tried a lot of things. We've failed at a lot of things. We tried it a few more, maybe failed at those. And some of them are simple things. I'm drinking a latte today. Thank you, Jason, for making this. Or did you make this one? Oh, thank you. I'll thank you. We're, either of you are good. Okay, let's, a few people came to me about a month ago and said, hey, we'd like to get the espresso working, make it working again and all that stuff. Well, can I tell you, we've tried this three times. It's failed three times over the last 14 years, right? So somebody said, oh, we've tried that. It didn't work. And I heard that. And I jumped in and said, no, no, let's do it again. <laughs> right? Why not? Maybe, I mean, that's a really simple thing. But let me tell you about anybody in anything, when you try something and it doesn't work, it's hard to do it again. Yeah, I don't care what it is. As simple as making a latte. Oh, we did that. 2004. You're right, we did. Didn't work. Well, we tried that in 2009. You're right. Lasted about a year. 
We tried that in 2000. Yep. But we haven't tried it this year. Let's do it. Because this way, I'm telling you, let me just, let me just say, this is, a, this, is, this is not a rip on anybody because I can fall in this thing too. Let me tell you, no pastor goes into ministry to manage a dying church. Can I just tell you that? Right? Nobody says, I feel called by God. I'm going to go get trained and my goal is to come out and just sustain a church that's going to die in five years. Nobody wants that. You know, that's what most churches are right now. Do you know why they all quit? Because they were tired of failing. They were tired of failing. At some point, maybe the third try, they said, this isn't worth it. And they quit. Now, when I tell you that story, that should give you a heart for people in ministry. It's hard. It's hard to bring the same thing to people again when it didn't work last time. It's hard to come and say, draw up excitement for this is worth going with it. And they remind you of 1995 and 1998. And I, yeah, 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 I know that. And I thought, well, what the heck? Samuel failed seven times. And number eight was pretty good. I want you to hear people, don't be afraid to fail in your life. Don't be afraid to try even the same thing multi-times. Talk to any businessman who has succeeded and they will give you a whole story of failures. Almost any, I, I could say almost every millionaire has lost millions of dollars. They all have. Most of them have gone bankrupt, probably multiple times, right? And some of you walk in the business world, you can just hear story after story of failure. Well, they're okay now. You know why? Because they didn't quit. They didn't give up. I, I, if, uh, you know, I, I coach basketball and, and I coach baseball too, and both of them have a, a, a propensity to uh, fail a lot. Bunches. Like I couldn't pick a sport where you could actually succeed a lot. No. Total failure sports. So shooting. I love it when my team shoots. I am a coach that loves shooting, wants them to shoot, light it up, go for it, all that stuff. Guess what happens when you shoot a lot? You miss a lot. Guess what happens when you miss a lot? You don't want to shoot anymore. So I have to grab a kid sometimes. And I say, listen, this is, this is the, I always tell them this. I said, you've got to subscribe to the Larry Bird shooting philosophy. And I have to explain to them who Larry Bird is because, <laughs> like, who? Is he like on Sesame Street? Or they, and I said, he says, when you're hot, shoot. When you're not hot, shoot until you get hot. Hey, what if we had that philosophy in following God? You know, there are times, and I've been there. It seemed like every, I had the Midas touch. Everything I touch turns to gold. Boo! I'm like, whoa! Let's try this. Oh, wow! Try, it was, it, there have been seasons, and it's, it's always during revival, but there are seasons of ministry that everything you touch is awesome. And so what happens is people say, you're great, and you get invited to speak here, and you go there. Listen, those same people who are awesome will soon do the same thing, and it won't work. I've been there. Like, oh, gee, this worked really well last time, and now it's terrible. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to quit. Well, that wasn't a good decision. Don't quit. Don't quit, because you know what? You'll get hot again. You just will. If you're 0 for 7, shoot the 8th shot. It might go in. Don't quit. Because if you don't shoot the 8th shot, you won't make that either. So you might as well go down swinging. And I'm telling you, there's principles like this in ministry, even in the prophetic. Samuel is walking in the prophetic of God and he's not seeing results. So if you hear nothing else today, people, if you're 0 for 7, do one more. Do one more. Be encouraged. Wherever it is you are and you just don't think it's working, do one more. And then if you still feel it's not working because that didn't work, just try one more time seeking God for that. It might be the one and go for it on that. So, he, so finally he does this. He says, uh, I, th I believe Samuel's getting concerned. And, and so uh, then he asks, um, he says, these are, the Lord has not chosen these, verse uh, 11. So, so, uh, so he asked Jesse, I love this. Is this all you got? <laughs> this is it? This was a real bad day. 
Is, are these all the sons you have? And I love Jesse. He says, oh, that's right. <laughs> I got one more. But you know what? He's out in the fields. He's with the sheep. He's kind of busy. Uh, he's probably ceremonially unclean. Uh, he doesn't come around much. And he's got this, he likes a harp. I mean, this guy is, you know, he's out there. And so he's, he had to be reminded that he had one more son. Imagine David, right? When, when, you know, fortunately I have two kids. I think that's because I can keep track of two. I don't know if I can handle three. I certainly couldn't handle seven plus the one I forgot. Um, and, and so David, because you got to hear this too, and, and Jeff mentioned it, but some of you feel forgotten. Man, this is a big deal. If the, 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 the ultimate man of God shows up at your house to anoint one of the sons and you weren't even invited to the party, that's not good. Not at all. And so David's dealing with some issues here. And I love what Samuel says. He says after that, he says they're still uh, the youngest. Uh, he, says, he says, but he is tending sheep. Samuel said, I love this. Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. He says, and nobody leaving till he gets here. Nobody's leaving. Because they, they were at a big festival. They were sacrificing. And he says, nobody sits down. This is why. Because it rose up in Samuel that this was the one that was going to work. This was the one. And you've been there. I've been there. Where all of a sudden it's like, this is the one. The problem is, this is the problem, and bear with anybody who's leading whatever you're leading. This could be a business, in the family, at the church or whatever. You've watched them say no seven times and now they're trying to convince you that this is the one. It's hard to do because you just, like, couldn't you just have taken this guy? We could be home now watching the game. Really? What was wrong with number three? I liked him. Four was okay. I really liked one. Really? We got to wait for this guy? I don't even like this one. But Samuel had to get forceful and said, nobody's leaving. I, I can't quite do that even with a straight face, but lock the doors, right? Nobody's going home. We're waiting here till he comes because this is the one God has chosen. And so when, when he brought, uh, David comes, he anoints David. And here's how we're going to end. So I want you to you hear clearly that Samuel had fortitude to keep going on. And because he had the fortitude, yes, he saw Saul, but what he produced was David. If you don't give up, you'll produce the guy after God's own heart. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going on. And then, and, and then, then he, he comes. And So Samuel took, uh, um, then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Verse 13, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. That's actually a really important thing. Uh, God, had, God doesn't need to do everything amazingly publicly, but God does need to do it in the presence of some people. He had to be, it had to be done in the presence of his brothers. Uh, what if David said, hey guys, it was pretty cool the other day. Samuel came and in the privacy of my field anointed me. Well, then we got a whole Joseph situation, right? Throw him in a well, give him a coat, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but he did it in the, so your anointing doesn't need to come in front of everybody, but it will be demonstrated to the key people. It's really an important thing. Uh, so he took him and, and in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power, and Samuel then, then left. Here's what I want you to hear about David. We'll come back to that heart thing next week and the inward and the outward appearance. It's actually, it's actually, you need to come back because there's something in this that's going to free us to minister to people in a way we've never ministered before. I know that. I know if we start seeing people for who they really are, it will change our ministry. And also, if we, if, we, if we get a hold of letting the inside flow out of us, we will be able to minister in ways we've never seen before. So I'm, I'm really serious. I think there's something special about next week, and I just thought of that this morning. So, um, so he anoints David, and watch this. The anointing came on. What is the anointing? That is a $1,000 question that we could debate forever and ever, and they're probably all semi-correct answers. But here's what I want us to hear from the anointing of God, the anointing of David. David went from being a shepherd who was doing fine, right? He was loving God. He may have written even, we don't know, but he could have been worshiping. He was fine. He was a, a godly man. You know, we could call him saved, even filled with the Spirit. 
But then on came the anointing. Everything changed in his life. He had that, from that point on knew who he was. He was anointed to be king. Was he king? Absolutely not. He wasn't even close to being king. But at that point, he knew who he was called to be. Now, not many of us are going to be called to be kings. Um, if by chance you do, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, but, uh, but I tell you, every one of us needs to know who we are. We've got to. We have to receive that anointing from God. That, that even is a, it could be, even be a vocation. It could be a ministry. It could be whatever it is. God's going to set you apart for being you. I don't care what age you are. You go through different seasons. It doesn't matter. God has called you. And at this point, David knew who he was. He knew who the you was in his life. And from that point on, when God poured out his anointing on him, his call upon him, whatever terminology, a powerful infilling of the spirit and the gifts flowed, I, whatever terminology makes sense to you, you got to know at that point, David was no longer questioning who he was. Now, of course, from that point on, everything went all peaches and cream in David's life, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you talk about, like, oh, could we get that oil off me? This didn't go so well. I mean, honestly, David's life for the next, we can speculate a little bit, but let's say the next 20 years was like a, a bad soap opera. It was hard. The, he had that little cool thing where he killed Goliath. That was kind of a neat thing. Uh, but... Honestly, other than that, it was a very difficult life for David. What got David through that difficulty was this, the anointing, the call. How could David have confidence to go fight Goliath? Of course he has confidence in his God, but he was anointed by the man of God, demonstrated by the power of God to be king of Israel. Do you think Goliath is going to bump him off? No way. I've been in situations before that I had absolutely no fear, not because I had any strength in the world or that I really even had any faith that God was going to get me out of it. But I knew I couldn't die because God had promised things ahead for me. I, I'm just telling you, you've you got to see beyond it. Oh, if I'm going to have children that are going to reach the nations, I might have to be alive. Right? So they, I'm sure when David went to Goliath, he was thinking about the anointing that came on him at Samuel. If I'm going to be king, I might have to be alive. I'll take him on. Not wise, but he says, the anointing, the call. I can take this guy down because God's called me to take down nations. One nine-footer or nine million people. He says, I can get this guy. Not a problem. But I'm telling you, it's the anointing. It's being set apart. It's that confidence. It's when God spoke to him. It's when God came upon him. And here's what I want us to hear this year. Uh, no matter, and you, you've had different times in your life where you're confident of it. But here's the thing, though. Even when you're confident of it, the, pretty much the enemy's tool is continually trying to convince you that what you thought was real wasn't real. That's a, that's a common, it's a very good tool. If I were the devil, I would use that all the time. Uh, I wouldn't go after and beat you up. I would convince you that the real call on your life isn't the real call on your life. So you, this, is, this year, some of you, for the first time, need to receive the call and the anointing and the confidence of who you are. You need, for the first time, you need to get it. Others of you need to get it rock solid because you've questioned it. You've spent the last six months or the last six years or whatever questioning it. I can tell you, it's what, how, here's, okay, and I'll end with this, because how do you get it, right? That's a cool thing. It's pretty ambiguous. I, I doubt Samuel is going to walk in here with a horn of oil and anoint you and say, you know, princess over the county, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> why not, right? That'd be cool. Uh, but, so it's not going to happen like that. So how do we receive the call? How do we receive the anointing? It is not just a call to ministry. It's a call to your life. You've got to hear that. It's a call to life, the life God's given you. So um, it can happen in a thousand different ways, and it's always going to be unique to you. Here's the common thread in everybody's call. It happens in the presence of Jesus. So you might, if you want to hear from somebody, you might want to be with them. 
So let me encourage you, if you have no clue what's going on in your life, why don't you spend time with God? Pursue him. Pursue him. Go after it. Be a pursuer. I think that, uh, uh, this year, a uh, pursuer. Be a pursuer of God. I, I can remember the very first time I was convinced at the call in my life, um, I, was, uh, I was on uh, 230 North Atherton Street in State College, Pennsylvania. I lived on the second floor in a very rundown house. Uh, I lived there because it was very cheap and that's all I cared about at that time. Uh, and, and, and I was on the roof out my door and I was praying and there was, there's only been two times that I, have, I, I, it was so clear I turned around because I thought somebody had sneaked out the window and was talking to me. And, and I turned around and God so clearly spoke a call, the, the call on my life. I was on the roof of a junky old house that if two other people came out, the roof might collapse. Um, and, but God spoke to me and I'm telling you, from that day forward, I have hung on to that through thick and thin. Now there've been many other times God's confirmed it, but there was a moment what was I doing out there? I was pursuing him. I, I mean, I was so crazy back then. I went on the rooftop because I read that, you know, Peter was on the rooftop praying. I said, hey, if Peter heard from God on the roof, I'm going on the roof. And I was a little radical. And, and, and uh, so I, I went on the roof and I heard from God. So listen, if you want to get your call, you need to go down to Penn State. And it's, uh, it's just down the road from Hardee's. <laughs> so, but it's not that. It's not the spot. It's not that. But I tell you what it is. It's you pursuing God. It absolutely is you pursuing God. And so it's an individual thing. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm telling you, you've got to pursue him. You've got to, be, you've got to be aggressive toward it. You can't just pass. You've got to say, God, I'm, I'm not going to just exist for the next 30 years. I need to know. I need to know the call on my life. I need to know what, where, who I am in you. I've got to get a hold of this. He says, if you draw near to God, what does James say? God will draw near to you. There's, it's that, actually, that order is really important. God will apprehend you and pluck you out of the garbage, right? But then, if you want to really pursue him, he'll take big steps to you, but you've got to take little steps to him after that point. Take a little step, he takes a giant step take a little step. He takes a giant step. I'm telling you this year, may it be a year and I'll just speak for me. I don't want to be lazy in my pursuit of God this year. I want to get to things. And how, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things. I can tell you there are places where I hear from God better than other places. So if that's true, I should spend more time in the places where I know I can hear from God. I'm telling you, go get after things. Get to worship times. Get to, get to your prayer closet, get to travel, go places, go to, I don't know what it takes, do something to pursue God this year that is aggressive. Because if we pursue him, he will not disappoint us, period. Those of you who have been around a while, you remember days. Some of you are old enough to remember the huge Bibles you carried everywhere. Remember those? Yeah. Those charismatic Jesus people. Um, yeah, you still got it. I mean, they was huge Bibles and everything was underlined. It didn't make any sense because when you underline everything, nothing's not underlined. I mean, it was, we ate, so you remember those days. What were you doing? You were pursuing God. Why? Why for 30 years after the charismatic movement are the people out of the charismatic movement still leading the churches? Why? Because they pursued God so stinking much. Just pursued them. And they went after them. Or wherever it is, you went to conferences, you went to, who's been to the screwy midweek services? Me? I went everywhere when I was in college. Weird places. Fortunately in Pennsylvania, they don't handle snakes, but some of them would have if we had been one state south. And it was weird stuff I was in, but I didn't care because I said, I'm going to meet God anywhere. And I just went after him and all these things. And, and I'm telling you, God honored it. Why? Because it was my heart. I wanted him. I'd go into midweek services with me and six other people. And it was not like a really great time. I'm like, why did I stop here? You know, I saw the sign and it was just a weird time in my life that I went after all these things. They, they were very excited because if you have six people in your church and one person shows up, I mean, it's, <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> Although I, I was in one church though once where there were 12 people and I came and nobody said hi to me. That was a very strange one. I did not go back there. That was really awkward. Uh, but but I mean, let me just end with this because got, you got things to do. But I'm telling you this year, God wants to anoint you in a stronger way than ever before, ever. You expect that this year. We're not going to be able to contain. We're not going to. Oh, I just I got to be careful because I get really emotional. We're not going to be able to contain 
what God wants to do. We're not going to. But it's not going to happen with lazy people. It's not. God is not saying, just give me about 300 lazy people. But that's what we think. Man, let's go after it this year. Let's get passionate. I, I, I talked to somebody who took on, who said, I have to get up early in the morning to pursue God. I need to do that. And so they actually did something that held them extremely accountable to getting up early in the morning. What is that telling you? They're pursuing. I don't want to get up at 5 a.m. Holy cow. I'd only do that for breakfast or something like that that somebody else was buying. Um, <laughs> But whatever it takes, pursue God this year. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so good. Uh, next week, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am going to share some things next week that just to begin to flush out some things that are, that are coming up. It, it, this is a very exciting time, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen within this anointing of David. You know there are a lot of Davids out there? Lots. A lot. There's thousands of Davids in our region who are out in the field because everybody's forgotten about them. And they're pretty stinking gifted, right? They're amazing. They're amazing. And when we capture the heart of God, we're going to see that not as a shepherd boy. We're going to see him as a king. Even if it takes him 20 years to fulfill his call, that doesn't matter. During those 20 years, better if somebody, man, I, oh, I, I got to stop. I, just, I'm, this is a very exciting thing for me. But all right. I, I want to pray for you because I, I really want to pray that, that, uh, that really a strong anointing would, would begin a begin. This is a beginning. This is not. This is a marathon of the Spirit of God coming upon you, and and um, and all He's asking from us is, I am willing to pursue it, pursue Him, and uh, and listen. You got to get this in you. I am not going to quit. And please do this. When somebody could be even in your family failed three or four times and they want to try it again say come on I'll be with you I'll help you or maybe even nudge them hey remember the call on your life I was there 12 years ago when God spoke over you and your life's been pretty miserable since then because you've been walking away I'll stand with you let's help each other out let's drag them back drag me back drag you back drag us all back because God's got such big things got a ton of them. Father, I just pray that you would come in powerful ways this year. Powerful ways, Jesus. Do it in, in big time stuff, but have it start small, have it start personal, have it start with a bunch of individuals pursuing you. And as we individually pursue you, Father, have your way. Have your way. I know that you're going to pour out an anointing. I know you're going to give us such a, such a clear call as individuals, as families, as small groups, as this larger body we call Praise Fellowship, as this region. Father, may the region pursue you. You have a call on this region. Father, forgive us for being extremely lazy. Yes, Lord. Father, forgive us for after we've missed seven times that we have just quit. Lord, give us, give us that fortitude, that zeal, whatever it is, to go after it one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. I, I just want to encourage you, and we're, we're, we can be done here. Um, I'll, I'll just end with this. It was, I think, 2007 or 2008. I was with a bunch of teenagers, and we were down in Warren, and we were praying, and we were praying for the region. We were doing prayer walks. We were probably about 50 of us down there, and we were breaking up into groups and all that stuff. And, and uh, at that point, it still kind of is, but it seemed like every building in downtown Warren was for sale, which is slightly depressing when you're on a prayer walk, right? You're like, oh my gosh, every... So I'm kind of walking around like, man, God, is the whole town for sale? I mean... And I tell you, clear as can be, he spoke to me, he says, yes, and anybody willing to pay the price can take it all. It's all yours if you want to pay the price. And I'm telling you, I believe that as clear for today as ever, that this whole region is ours if we want it, and you do have to pay a price to get a building. 
So if we're willing to pay the price, the whole region is ours. The whole region. I think this is the greatest time ever for the church in America because everything is turning so far away from God. When you bring the real deal, it's easy. It's the best time ever. And so we're going to see it. So listen, you are free to go, but please don't let your expectancy go down. Encourage each other. Um, Praise God. So good to see all of you. There's a lot of people here today. First service was packed. You guys are packed. Mighty army coming up. So hallelujah. Hallelujah.